Okay, right. So now we're going to hear from um, Kim Martin about bootstrapping an RSC group at a university in South Africa and strategies, challenges and lessons learned. Um, so as I said, if you could please put your questions into Slido. We've cleared the previous set, so we'll start afresh. Um, if you're not asking a question, please also um, pod questions that you like upwards by voting for them and that will see your, your favourite question being asked. Uh, and after we've exhausted those, I'll come to any questions in the room. But we're going to use Slido because it's a nice way to give a voice to those who aren't confident enough to maybe put their hand up. OK, right. I'm going to hand over to Kim. Thank you, Kim. Kim Martin. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. I'm also a Software Sustainability Institute International Fellow. Um, and I'm going to talk about my efforts to establish the first RSC group in Africa. Um, so my start, basically, I learned about RSC for the first time at an R conference last year. Um, and it, it's turned into a bit of a slippery slope because uh, initially it was a sense of, well, this is, this is a career that I want to follow for myself. And then it turned into, well, I need a community of practice that I can grow as an RSC. And then um, it became quite quickly clear to me that there was um, both the demand and the potential for um, RSC at Stellenbosch University. Um, so there were researchers who could code and who wanted to collaborate across disciplines. I call them proto-RSCs. Uh, and uh, also researchers who made it, made it very clear that they would benefit from assistance and training. Um, so in terms of the local context, there is an online community that started, it launched in 2019. Uh, it was hampered a bit by COVID, but it's been growing uh, more recently now. Um, in South Africa, or Africa, um, there's so far been little or no awareness of RSE. That's been changing gradually thanks to the efforts of RSSE Africa. Um, but there is also a lack of a culture of writing RSEs into grants, which I believe is, is quite a foundational thing for um, our, the typical RSC group in the UK and elsewhere. And there are no existing UK, or have not been, not been any UK style RSEs groups with, with um, uh, standing army, I call them of RSEs. Um, I think that it's possible that African universities may not be able to support a large, a large staff of permanent RSEs. Um, and also the grants awarded to local researchers uh, may not be sufficient to support permanent RSCs. It seems that the, the funding pool has been shrinking a little bit in the last few years. So it, it is possible that a different model is needed in this context. Um, so given, given the challenges of trying to start something from scratch, um, the issue that's faced is uh, supply versus demand. So um, chicken and egg, how how do researchers know that they need RSCs if they don't know what RSCs are? And if, you don't, if nobody's asking for it, how can you uh, advocate for it? So, and also, how to establish an RSC group under conditions of limited resources? Um, so it seems to me that the, the answer to that is to leverage all resources and opportunities as much as possible. Um, so I launched RSC at Sun earlier this year. Um, the first steps have involved identifying supportive partners internally and externally, uh, raising awareness within, within the university community and also bootstrapping a service prototype. Um, in terms of supportive partners, um, I count the Carpentries as a partner, um, initially because they provide material that's excellent and widely available, freely available, uh, also that the, help, the helpful community. Um, but more recently, the Carpentries has actually granted me um, a silver membership for a year, which means that I can now train uh, instructors inside my, my university, and that will help me sort of roll things out more. Um, the SSI Fellowship um, has given me credibility uh, and also funds, uh, and I'll be talking a bit more about how I've been using those. Um, and also in terms of giving me um, credibility, um, they've been, uh, I've been, I've recruited a number of academics from fairly early on who um, were willing to be named as affiliated members of the RSC group. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they are um, four professors across multiple faculties, uh, includes the head of the computer science division, the chair of the Internet of Things, uh, and, and uh, some, some other people who've um, given support for various reasons. Um, I've also been 50% um, funded since April um, by Jan Hreling, who leads the Agroinformatics Initiative. Uh, and he's agreed uh, very recently that he will fund me full-time from March. Um, 
the university's uh, IT services has has indicated that they'd be willing to uh, collaborate in, in different ways. Uh, and as an indication of this, they've given me access to their service desk, um, where I promptly asked to have RSC added as a, as a, as a service. Um, um, the, um, so the School of Data Science and Computational Thinking is a faculty level entity uh, within Stellenbosch University. And I've been talking with the director about uh, it being uh, RSC at Sun's formal home in the near future. Um, and finally, this is an interesting one, I think. Um, so I came across this um, OSPO model, which I think might be interesting to RSE groups generally. Um, so an OSPO is an industry construct um, which has recently migrated into academia. Um, the idea is to mitigate the risks and maximize the benefits of developing and using open source software, um, including providing training and best practices. So Saeed Chowdhury was, uh, he pioneered this in Johns Hopkins University as the director, and he's now doing the same in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and I reached out to him and he agreed to be named as an advisor of RSC Sun, at Sun, uh, and um, I took advantage of that, as I'll indicate now. Um, so in terms of raising awareness within the university community, initially that's mostly been me giving talks. Um, talks internally, talks externally, talking informally to stakeholders, um, and um, that's been quite useful in establishing awareness and a presence. Um, I've also hosted uh, Saeed Chowdhury and one of his colleagues in Tech Transfer to give a talk to um, a cross-section of the university, including our tech transfer people and a bunch of academics and other people, about how their um, OSPO interacts with tech transfer. And that's sort of indirectly given me a bit more credibility and increased some interest in RSC at Sun, especially when I indicated that potentially an RSC group could serve some of the same functions as an OSPO. Um, so in terms of, uh, I, I fairly early on was getting some quite positive feedback from senior members of the university. Um, and they've made also some statements of, public statements of support. Um, I thought the, the dean who told me that he liked my naive enthusiasm was giving me a bit of a backhanded compliment, but you know. <laughs> um, so uh, I uh, promptly, um, at, you know, once things started gathering steam, put up a website because it seems to be that if you don't have a web presence, you don't exist. Um, and uh, I've been working on bootstrapping service prototypes. Um, so as I see it, an RSC group has uh, three, arguably four, main pillars of activity that they should be engaging in. Uh, so that would be training researchers in coding and best practices, providing consultations, um, and also um, providing coding support, coding engagements, and then arguably community building or nurturing existing communities within the university that they're hosted by. Um, in the training and the consulting, uh, so fairly early on I decided um, that I should initiate what I called Operation Rising Tide <laughs> as a awareness raising and service provision exercise. So my thinking was um, leverage the carpentries, including my certified instructor status, um, and also uh, leverage my international, my SSI fellowship um, to uh, provide consulting. Um, so on the carpentry side, I've provided one workshop so far, and I've got two more later this month. Um, and uh, on the uh, fellowship side, I've been, uh, the, the, the plan was then to use my funds to um, have, to arrange for UK-based RSCs to provide consultation to Stellenbosch University researchers. And the, the, the aim of that consultation is to support those researchers to start writing RSEs into their grants. So that, um, I mean, potentially some of these, these engagements, these consultation engagements may result in international collaborations, which is fine, but ideally they're going to result in people actually hiring locals who maybe at this point may not know that they're RSEs, but have the skills. So the output of the consultation engagement is supposed to be a, um, a short piece of text, which is a, the, the scope of what an RSC would do in the context of that researcher's work, and then also a list, a clear list of what skills would be required. So when that researcher is trying to hire someone, um, if their grant is funded, they know exactly who they're looking for, and that person doesn't yet need to be labeled an RSC. Um, on the subject of coding engagements, it starts getting a little bit more challenging, um, as I say, uh, not having yet a standing army. Um, so the, the, the idea that of um, recruiting these affiliated members, these professors who um, are interested in being involved in RSC at Sun, 
um, is what I call the ARM model, um, where potentially they have postgraduate students um, who would be interested in working on RSE projects, um, either as part of their academic work or potentially in, as interns or something else. Um, and then something that I've started exploring more recently uh, is sort of a, a time-sharing postdocs model. Um, and I've had um, uh, an established research group uh, make an offer to, to do something along those lines. Um, thinking ahead to needing to now start matching up people with skills and projects require certain skills. Um, I um, uh, started, I'm now mentoring a, a team of four honors students who, as part of their information systems thesis, have developed an ontology, the beginnings of an ontology of RSE. Um, and my, my thinking was to, is to use this ontology as, as a sort of operational tool for pairing up people with projects. Um, but in talking to um, various people, it seems that there's, there's more scope for it than just that, uh, and that it may be more useful in other ways as well to um, the broader RSC community. So the students have been accepted now into the Open Life Science program, uh, where they'll be trained in how to um, work openly, uh, and uh, community input would be very valuable. So um, this is uh, Megan, Nina, Renee, and uh, Ariana, who would be very keen to talk to you if you're interested. Um, and finally, uh, community building. Um, so this is maybe something that I'm, uh, I have the least uh, cl clarity as to how I'm going, about going to go about doing it, but I think it's a very important step. Um, I have some ideas, and I'd also be very interested in hearing from uh, people in this community who might have some ideas. Um, in terms of challenges, um, I, I like this quote, uh, moving a university is like moving a cemetery, you can't expect any help from the inhabitants. This is from Barbara, Barbara Oakley. Um, but in my experience, this is not actually true. Um, I, I've, I've received a lot of um, support, including some sust substantive support, moral support, which is surprisingly important. Um, so uh, yeah, I would disagree with this. Um, but there are contextual challenges. So, I mean, bureaucracy, politics, um, lack of resources, particularly in my case at this point, uh, learning curves, particularly in my case at this point, uh, and then uh, personal challenges. So, imposter syndrome, risk of burnout, uh, and I will, yeah, the, the former I, I'll admit to um, suffering with quite a bit. Um, lessons and next steps. Um, I would say my personal lesson is that leverage can be surprisingly effective. Um, and uh, on the other side of that coin, I would say that maybe the lesson for the international community uh, is that surprisingly little investment of resources and um, you say moral support, tokens of support, uh, can actually go a very long way when it comes to uh, establishing an RSC group, even in a place where there's at present nothing. Um, so uh, thank you for your time. Any advice or support of any form is highly appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I was worried that 46 slides would be too much for 20 minutes. <laughs> thank you very much, Kim. Uh, really interesting. And, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of what you say, and I'm sure it resonated with a lot of us in the, in the audience as well. But We'll, we'll go to the questions and then, you know, let's also give people time to reflect and then offer any comments as well as, you know, thoughts um, in response to some of Kim's um, challenges that she set out there that she's facing. Okay, so top of the deck in Slido. Through your awareness raising work, have you found proto RSE colleagues coming to have a similar realization to you and embracing RSE as an identity? Yeah, definitely. It's actually, um, uh, been quite the joy uh, with my evangelism that every so often you see the light bulb go off in someone else's eyes and they're like, oh, that's what I am. Uh, <laughs> at which point I, um, you know, in along the context of leveraging everything I possibly can, I promptly swoop on them and say, do you mind if I add you to the website as an embedded RSC? And I've had quite a few people agree to that, which is, which is quite cool. Um, I love the second one here. Keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely endorse that. Thank you. Yeah, well done you. And yes, how can the Society of RSE help you? But I'm going to widen that, actually. How could we here help you? Um, I've actually found it really helpful talking to people. Um, it's in terms of sparking, I mean, the moral support is great, but also sparking ideas and different ways of thinking. So even um, over the course of yesterday, talking to people, I've had a few more like, oh, yeah, I can 
could do this, and I could do this, and I could approach it this way, and I could see it this way, and it's it's actually very, very helpful. So, um, yeah, um, you never know. And anything specific from the society, I guess, as you know, credence um, from them as a body? Uh, yeah, I think I think potentially something that's going to be important, maybe, maybe specifically in my context, um, is external sources of funding, like I, which means that I need to skill up in approach, identifying funders and funding opportunities and writing grant applications and things like that. Um, so potentially this is something that the, the society might be able to help me and others like me, um, because there's that sort of big picture strategy, how to position things, who to approach, um, and also, like I say, like credibility, you know, I'm not being a nobody, actually having the backing of an organization, even if it's in just, you know, yes, this person actually kind of, you know, is doing something. Um, I think it goes a long way. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, in South Africa, is there an overlap of RSE and SSI recognition and activities? So when you, so you're saying recognition, so, so South Africans seeing the SSI and RSE are the same thing? I'm guessing, is the does the person who posted that want to comment? Have we got that right? Yeah. Sorry, I'll bring the microphone up to you. You mentioned SSI as a, a, a organization which will help you, I think. So in that sense, you, you were trying to drum up some um, recognition of, of, of ASI in South Africa. To what extent is SSI recognized in South Africa? already? I wouldn't say it is. Um, so I, again, as part of my leveraging everything I can, whenever I'm giving a talk, whenever I'm talking to people, I name drop as much as I can. Uh, but I wouldn't say that the SSI at present is well known. You know, I, I, I have to define it every time, basically. Um, but I think, I think, you know, through my efforts, it's maybe becoming somewhat more well known. <laughs> I think a, a question here for context. I'm interested to know what's the approximate size of Stellenbosch in terms of staff, student numbers, research income. Can I'm you not, give us an equivalent to the I'm, UK? I'm not going to attempt to do that because um, there will be record of my ignorance. Um, <laughs> but uh, Stellenbosch University, I would say, is one of the biggest, most prestigious universities. I mean, they, they vie with UCT, University of Cape Town. Um, so they, they're, they, they are... I think one of the, the leaders. So basically, I mean, I think if the, the, the question is sort of going to, if they get an RSC group, you know, if, if they're seen to be championing the RSC group as a, as a construct, will that hold weight? I think it definitely will. Um, and I have reason to believe that UCT is, is on the bandwagon now, getting there. <laughs> Great. Um, do you have, or uh, are you hoping to have a wider network of proto RSEs in Africa? And how much, sorry, yeah, let you do that bit first. So I, I would say that um, RSSE Africa, so that predates me. Um, so when I first learned about RSE last year, RSSE Africa had already been in existence for a um, couple of years, but you know, there hadn't been much, much happening, I said COVID and other things. Um, but they are now starting to ramp up more. Um, and I think they're getting traction and they're doing a lot um, uh, nationally, I'd say, um, or even across the continent. Um, so I think that's that's something that is is going to start growing now. Um, and it, 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 we we bounce off each other. I mean, I'm I'm friends with um, um, some of the founders, and um, yeah, I think what I do reflects well on them, and what they do reflects well on me. So. Thank you. Yeah, this is interesting. Have you met any specific resistance to the idea of RSEs as a concept? And how do you handle that? Um, maybe I'm just very persuasive, or maybe people are just very kind, but mostly not. Um, I, I would say that as long as you approach people where they are on things that they care about, they tend to get the point. Um, I would say maybe resistance is practical things, like um, when I start talking to members of the university, um, the more senior members of the university, and I start talking about other oh, UK models, how underwriting is sometimes a thing, and I kind of get this, yeah, it's not going to happen here. Uh, so. Yeah, too easy for them to say, maybe. Um, 
Has the structure of university departments, faculties made a difference in your efforts, either positive or negative? Um, I, I, I would say I've, I've tried to, I've consciously, well, I'm getting support from a particular faculty, um, but I am conscious of the fact that I'm trying, I want to try to um, have RSC be very much seen as outside the usual silos across across disciplines across so I've made a big effort uh, and I think have to keep on making a big effort to to connect with people in different disciplines um, so I have the ambition of building a governing board and my intention was to have members from every faculty on that board so far I have engineering and law um, yeah but um, I would say there's there, there is this general sort of turf and silo problem but, but yeah, you can, only, you can only try and make sure that you help people as much as possible across, across disciplines. Indeed, I think a lot of us would recognize that. Mm. Um, I'm gonna deal with two of these slightly lower down so then we can scrub them off maybe. Um, uh, somebody quickly Googled, thank you very much. Looks like 32,000 students, there we go. Um. <laughs> um, yes, HPC or research data. There is, um, uh, there is an academic IT um, uh, service and and they're the ones that I've been engaging with and they're say very um, interested in collaborating the, uh, the it's they, they there is a difference I think in the kind of services that they're offering and how an RSC group might operate but I'm really hoping to work very closely with them in the future and the um, HPC um, I've been talking from from fairly early on with um, one of the uh, HPC managers and he's actually listed again listed on the RSC at Sun website uh, and I've been talking to him about um, him participating in carpentry's style workshops where he actually is uh, able to use that to get more interest and um, more pipeline of people into the HPC services um, so yeah great thank you uh, not a question the uh, research software alliance can maybe help with international expertise that's a great idea thank, thank you thank you for community building, you're doing the right thing by organising meetings. That will grow organically with the right stewardship. I think we said this yesterday, didn't we, Kim? It's yeah. kind of like the field of dreams thing. You build it, they will come. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've got the right skills for it, though. So one of those sort of, like, I think it's it's specific people who can do that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure I've got that right, but I can only try and try and recruit people who are enthusiastic and, and skilled in that kind of thing. Um, but we, we shall see. Yeah. Thank you, very inspiring indeed, um, fully concur. Another thing that RSEs or more general research computing groups provide is running research computing systems, e.g. HPC, research data storage, FIMS. I think, guess this comes back to your point yep. about collaborating with those groups earlier. Yep, yep. Interestingly, I'm not sure if this is a question, is that a question? I don't think so, I think it's more of a statement, but please yep, do, yep. Please do um, follow on that. Yeah, in interestingly, so the, the honours students are busy building the RSE ontology, uh, so I'd, I'd suggested that they start out with um, skills, services and technologies at the top level classes. Um, and I'd given them some suggestions, but someone that they spoke to, and apologies, I forgot who it was, suggested they add infrastructure to that. And I think that, that falls under that. Yeah. Um, this is a great next question. Do you think there might be need to, for a playbook as such for starting RSE teams in developing economies with those, with those particular contextual yeah. challenges maybe yeah I think so so as I said I'm I'm my interest so I say my, my next steps is exploring models for being able to provide RSC services without having a standing army of RSCs um, and it may be the case that there never really is the potential for having the kind of standing army that is common in the UK RSC groups and elsewhere um, so I'm interested in exploring ways of say leveraging the existing skills in the community in different ways and I've got different kind of models for that so potentially something like that might make that that whatever I manage to find if, it, if I find something that works that may be something that can be more generally used in similar contexts um, and then in terms of as I, as I was saying the, the, the support that the RSC community can give um, so for example the my, my SSI fellowship project of um, is relatively leveraging a relatively small amount of money to um, I think potentially make quite a large impact because the focus is on trying to um, prime the pump how do you get people to start 
you know, using what funds they can get access to to get the right kind of support and um, uh, you know include best practices and things like that. But um, engaging skilled RSCs from overseas in very targeted engagements. So you know this is what this researcher is trying to achieve. Okay, let me brainstorm with you in in your context and explain to you what an RSC can do for you, and then let me actually help you with the bits of your grant that you're going to. You're, going to, you're busy preparing of, you know, how would you word this that an international funder, say, would be compelled to say, okay, this, this, this person is using international best, best practice jargon. Um, but they actually, it does sound like they know what they want and they know how to, who they're looking for because those skills would need to be there. And maybe that comes back to the ontology as well, um, having a clear sense of what skills are required. Um, but yeah, maybe that's, a, it's a, like I say, a pump priming exercise, yeah. getting things started. Yeah. Great. Um, a final couple of supportive yes, comments yes, here, I yes. think. This, this is something I'm very, very excited about. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, the, the a central RSC group being useful in making connections between research silos and triggering new collaborations. I'm, this, is, this is one of the things that I keep on getting extremely excited about. Um, I had someone uh, say that, introduced me the term, a knowledge broker. And I think it's a very, very natural position for an RSC to be in if they are pivoting from one part of the university to the other part of the university, engaging quite deeply with researchers in their own domains, and then they might find themselves talking to someone in one faculty and go, hey, you know, I was working with someone last week who's got something that's somewhat peripherally involved with what you're doing, but potentially you could either take something from what they're doing and apply it, you know, orthogonally, or actually collaborate with them. So um, I do think that's, that's definitely a, a, an under, understated role for an RSC group. So here's an interesting offer. Question for the audience as well. Would UK universities lending out our standing army to Stellenbosch and others, I suppose, um, you know, for portions of time, however that might work? Would that be useful, beneficial to both sides? It would, well, it would definitely be beneficial to Stellenbosch University, but um, given how oversubscribed most of the RSC groups seem to be, I'm not sure if it's very possible. Um, this was actually part of my ambition, um, sure, sure, my my, uh, when, when I first started talking about my SSI project, um, I got very excited about this um, uh, RSC pool concept because, uh, so my logic was that, so in, in, in working through the logistics of how to get something like this going, it seems that a big part of the challenge is actually just getting people onto the system of, you know, whatever financial system that they need to be paid from. But then once you're over that hurdle and they're on the system, Technically, you've got a virtual army that's distributed across the country that you could potentially tap into relatively easy for future projects. Um, so that maybe doesn't answer the question exactly. Maybe more useful to the UK. Well, but yeah, I think Andy's got a point on this. Just to add. Yeah, I mean, one, one obvious potential option there is a lot of the trainings online now that teams in the UK and elsewhere are flat, and South Africa is not far off the yeah. UK. One hour at time, so, two hours at worst. Yeah, so, you know, if we could join you up to the people who provide training, then there's the opportunity to take the training burden yeah. off just you. That would be really, really and, useful. And that frees up your time to do the stuff yeah. that is more difficult to offer. Yeah, that would be really useful because <laughs> I, um, I sent out a... Uh, advertised that RSC at Sun is now in the, the business of providing um, work, carpentry's workshops to the university. And I, I um, opened up a... a an expression of interest form to capture information from people in the university. So I was asking, you know, of the buffet of options, you know, Python, R, SQL, um, you know, Git, and other things. Um, you know, what's your what's your level of experience? What's your level of interest on a subject by subject level? Uh, how willing you? How interested or willing would you be to teach such a material if you haven't already know it? Uh, and um, I, I think the most recent count was like 170 something. You know. From the first from, from the first round, I mean, it's only been advertised once. Uh, so I've got this pool of people, and I can sort of pick and choose what they're interested in, what machine are they using, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I've, I've definitely got a bit more uh, subscription to that than I can teach myself at the moment. So that would be very useful. Um, Great, I think there's a great offer there. Um, Kim, there's a couple of other comments and helpful um, ideas up there, maybe for you to take away. I'm going to draw this to a close though because we're, we're rapidly running out of time just to say thank you again to Kim very much final round of applause and yeah keep fighting the good fight Kim